Hello people, some of you have asked me about my inspiration, about how did I find my style, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Thanks again, this is Mark Ibanez. I'm a boudoir photographer in Washington, D.C. If you're new to my channel, welcome. If you are not, welcome back. Today, I am going to talk about how to find your style. And by style, I mean that special attribute, the special characteristic, the special quality that makes your work unique and recognizable. That thing that when people look at your images, they know immediately that it's you. And I think this is so important for us photographers because we want our work to stand out, to be different from anybody else's work. Uh, so I thought it would be a good way, a good way to do this is by explaining my, my quest in finding my style. You know, the things I did uh, to find my style and hopefully that will help you find yours. So I would like to begin by showing you some of my early work. Okay, so when I began to do boudoir photography about six years ago, I was following a couple of photographers that I loved and I was trying really hard to mimic their work. And as a result, my images mm, end up looking a lot like theirs. And even though, you know, they were beautiful, very high key, you know, a lot of eye contact, people smiling, uh, and people seemed to like my work, they were booking me but I wasn't feeling happy about it. I wasn't connecting with my work. I, I felt that there was something missing. So I began to uh, explore different things. And in this quest of exploring things, I began to accumulate a lot of equipment and I will bring to my shoots two suitcases full of stuff. You know, I will bring three different cameras, one full frame, one crop sensor, one Polaroid and then uh, strobes and flashes and triggers and tripods and soft boxes and modifiers and it was painful to move around it was difficult to handle uh, especially when i when i went out of town to do shoots uh, you know to bring all this stuff in the train or in the bus or move it around the city it was really difficult and i was also trying you know different uh, light setups with two lights three lights four lights but none of these things were working there was nothing that i was happy with and you know it took me a long time uh, until i took this photo you know so um, there's a before and after in my in the quest of my style with with this photo there was uh, when i took this photo and i looked at it at the back of my camera i i loved everything about it and it was exactly what I was looking for. I love the contrast, I love the volume, I love the, the, the use of light and shadows. I even like the small details, like for example, the, the ring on her right hand and this hint of light in the darkness. So I was totally in love with this photo because it reminded me of a painting, a 17th century painting like this. This is a Rembrandt. And I'm not trying here to compare my work to the work of the master painters, but it was the first time in my life that I felt I could recreate or create something similar to what I consider to be the most beautiful expression of art that I knew with just my camera and some light. And so that for me was, was wonderful. So let me explain a little uh, about my, my, my love of... Um, 17th century master painters because they think you know it, it will be beneficial for you to understand that i grew up in a neighborhood where all the streets were named after painters so i have friends that lived in leonardo da vinci and tintoretto donatello my girlfriend uh, lived in Michelangelo, and so and so on and so forth so i had exposure to all these guys from a very young age and i remember i would spend hours uh, looking at the, the paintings, uh, their paintings in an encyclopedia my parents had and thinking about how amazing, how, how, was able, how they were able to paint these masterpieces which is a paintbrush and some paint. Okay, so there are four uh, painters that are my favorite painters and I'm, I would like to explain to you the reasons why I love them. The first painter I would like to talk to you about is Rubens and there's a lot of things I like uh, about Rubens, but more than anything, 
I like his composition. His paintings are extremely complex in terms of composition, right? There's a lot going on. There's a lot of movement and every character, every, everything in Rubens' paintings have a very specific purpose. They're placed in a very specific way to direct your eyes to uh, a place in, in the painting. And also his characters are very powerful and strong and they all look like gods and goddesses, right? It's, it's crazy. He uses color, uh, you know, primary colors, yellows, reds, and blues. And there's also a lot of sensuality and naked bodies in his paintings. And it's kind of uh, interesting because he, he was a very religious person and a lot of his paintings had religious uh, themes. You know, they, they, he, he was doing a lot of uh, biblical scenes in his paintings. So uh, it's interesting to see this dichotomy between, you know, sensual bodies, naked bodies and religion. But I think it's almost, you know, human. Uh, because we all face this kind of dichotomies, you know, with good and evil and light and shadow, for example. So very interesting combination there. The next painter I would like to talk about is Caravaggio. And Caravaggio is probably the best example of the use of this technique called uh, chiaro oscuro, which is no other than the combination of light and shadow to create volume, to create drama. And, dra and Caravaggio, he, he created a lot of drama in his paintings. You, you'll see in all his paintings, there's, uh, they are very dramatic, but he went a step further and he created his own style, uh, like super dramatic, super dark, right? And it's called Tenebroso, which means very dark and creepy, actually. And his paintings are very in your face, you know, very violent at times. And, Himself, Caravaggio was a very special, uh, very controversial character. He was a little crazy, you know, he was one of those guys that is work hard and play harder. Uh, he will get drunk a lot of times. He was uh, very violent at moments. He actually killed a man. Uh, so I think that personality is reflected in his paintings. You will see a lot of uh, a lot of that in his paintings. Lots of drama, lots of contrasts, and really cool paintings for my taste. Okay, the next one is uh, Vermeer, and I absolutely love Vermeer. He's one of my my favorite painters of all times. Uh, not only because of the use of contrast, the use of light and shadow, the use of colors. You know, primary colors, reds, uh, blues, and yellows, but also because he was one of the first painters to paint uh, people doing simple things, you know, simple normal things uh, in, in life, like this girl uh, pouring milk. You're going to find people in his paintings reading books or playing an instrument. So he had a, this he had this journalistic approach to to painting. You know? He was one of the first ones. Um, in doing that, but also his paintings look almost like photographs. There's a lot, a lot of detail and a lot of scholars now think that he was using a device to create his paintings. Uh, so for example, in this painting, uh, this is the uh, lace maker and uh, a lot of people think this is the most beautiful painting in the Louvre. But anyway, so if you see, if you, if you take a look at the threads that are in the bottom half of the painting, let's look at the detail. And those threads look as if they were out of focus. And this is something that is impossible to see with a naked eye, with a human eye. It's impossible to see those threads like that with your eyes. This is only possible to see through a lens. So that's why a lot of people think that he used some sort of device with lenses to kind of capture the, the people in his paintings. And probably what he used was something called the camera obscura, which is uh, this thing here, which is no other than a, in a box, a dark box with a lens that uh, captures, projects an image uh, at, the, at the back on top of a canvas, and then Vermeer was just painting on top, right? So, uh, and some people think that this is, you know, kind of cheating, but I think this is actually innovative, right? So uh, I love Vermeer work, even if he was doing this, I think he was, ahead of his time and I just love his work. Maybe because of the photographic quality to it, I don't know, but 
you know, I, anyways, I, I like his, his work. Okay, so the last painter I would like to talk about is Rembrandt. And all of us photographers, I think, are familiar with Rembrandt lighting and how beautiful it looks in portraits. And he's best known for his portrait work. And I specifically like his portrait work at the end of his life, at the end of his career as a painter. And at this moment, he was in a difficult situation. And he went through a lot in his life. You know, his wife died. Uh, he lost his, the, his kids uh, to the plague. He was bankrupt. He was in a lot of debt. So I think all these things, all this, the, his state, that the state of mind he was in, made him paint in a different way. And a lot of people thought that his paintings looked ugly, and they looked unfinished. Uh, but I think that actually that characteristic made Rembrandt. Rembrandt. So these things uh, made him paint in a different way and that's what made his work recognizable and unique, different from other painters. So at this point in his career he was not too concerned about painting every single detail of you know the, the fingernails or you know the, 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 the eyebrows. No, he was more concerned about other things. He was able actually to create the illusion of detail and to capture the essence and humanity of his subjects with just a couple of brush strokes. And I think that was genius, right? So, for example, if we look up close to one of his portraits, in this case, uh, one of his self-portraits, uh, if you look at his ear, for example, and you isolate the ear from the rest of the painting, you you will never guess that that's an ear. What you're going to see is just um, brush strokes going in different directions and blobs of paint of different colors, but you will never guess that's an ear. The only way you're going to know that's an ear is when you put it in context, when you put it with the rest of the painting. And that's the beauty about Rembrandt's work, because then the responsibility of finishing the painting is up to the viewer to finish the painting. It's up to the viewer to give the context, to give the meaning to the painting, and I think this is very special because he was able to create this bond between him, his work, and his audience, which is us. And it's such a strong bond that it has a transcend time. You know, it's still alive after hundreds and hundreds of years. We're still talking about Rembrandt. We're still looking at his images or his paintings and trying to understand what, what is that he was trying to communicate. And this is the beauty about his work. I think this is the, the genius part of his work is that we, he is still uh, relevant up until today, right? So there's a couple of things that I think we can learn from these painters. The first one is that your work has to be a reflection of who you are. When people look at your photos, they're not only going to see the things and the people that you, f you photograph, but they also should see you. Your, f your work has to be a reflection of who you are. You should be able to uh, in, in incorporate the elements of your personality into your work. And once you do that, that is, that is the thing that is going to make your work unique and recognizable. So the second thing is that I think we as artists, we as photographers, we almost have the responsibility, the obligation to communicate something with our work, to create this connection between us and our viewers, us and our audience, to make something that resonates with them, to make something that is memorable and to make them feel something when they look at our work. Okay, so these are the two things uh, that I think are very important in the quest of finding your style. And now let me share with you the components of my style that I think were influenced by, by these guys. Okay, so let's look at it. The first component I would like to talk about is the use of one light. And this is something that, you know, the masters did. Uh, they just use natural light for their uh, portraits, for their paintings, and I use also one light. I, I love to work with natural light uh, when possible um, and I also use just one camera and one lens for the most part and it's because I like the concept of simplicity. I like to remove all non-essentials to focus on the things that I think add value to my work and those things are con the connection with my clients and the creation of art. 
So uh, yeah, so that's that's what I do. I don't have I don't want to have to worry about you know where I place the the strobes or you know if there's enough space for my tripods or anything like that. I like to focus on on what I'm doing, right? And that allows me to concentrate and create beautiful pieces for my clients. So uh, the next one is low key, and low key is uh, something that you have seen in, as you know in, in the in the painters that I show you. They all have this um, a lot of contrast in their paintings. I like to do the same in my photos because I think it creates volume. It gives a lot of volume to your images that otherwise are two dimensional. You know, it adds another dimension. Volume it creates drama and I, I love that it brings your eyes to focus on the highlights and that is exactly what i want because i want to enhance uh, the, the woman's natural curves and that i think helps a lot and so yeah that's why i, I like low key uh, photograph it doesn't mean that i don't you know i i also have images that are high key but i prefer low key uh, for sure the next one is a primer, the use of primary colors, and this I do whenever I can. Um, my preference is to use uh, yellows, reds, and blues. And so this this photo, for example, was taken in my studio, and here I can control a lot more, a lot more, a lot better what I want to have in my images. So you're going to see there's some red on the on the sides, and yellows and blues, and you know it, I think it just looks beautiful. It combines really nicely together. The next one is uh, emotion, and this is, I think, a big component of my work. I want my images to communicate something. Uh, I want to trigger specific emotions when people look at my photos. Uh, I want to communicate sexiness. I want to communicate uh, passion and sensuality, relaxation, and these things. So uh, this is, I think, a very important component of my work. Okay, but now there are three things you can do to find your own style. The first one is you have to know yourself. And by that, I mean you have to do a deep dive into your brain to really understand why is that you like the things that you like. And for that, I recommend you do the following exercise. So gather a lot of photos from different people, from different photographers, add some of my photos, add some of your photos, and then choose the ones you love the most. Choose the ones that grab your attention. Of this smaller selection then, what you're gonna do is you're gonna try to find the common thread, the common denominator between these images. Maybe you will find that the images you selected maybe are of people smiling, or maybe are wide angle shots, or maybe they are black and white. I don't know, everybody's gonna have a different selection. But the important thing here is that after finding the common thread, after finding this common denominator, think about why is that you like that. And you have to go back to the time when you were a kid. Because the experiences you had up until the age of eight is what shaped the person you are today. And that's crazy, right? But that's what happens. And I think about this all the time because I don't know what the impact I'm gonna have in my kids. And that, you know, it's a scary thought. Uh, maybe I'm traumatizing them, but that's how our brain works. So think about, you know, what, what is that uh, that happened to you when you were a kid that shaped your preferences today? Maybe you will find out that you love black and white because your dad or your mom used to watch black and white films. I don't know, maybe you like a specific color combination because it reminds you of the summer sunsets at the lake house. I don't know, once you understand a little better your preferences, you will then be able to incorporate this into your work. Uh, these changes will make you connect more deeply with your work and you will begin to feel more confident about it, okay? But please don't make the mistake to expect everybody to love what you do. That's just not going to happen. People process information through their own experiences. So the only thing that matters here is that you are happy with your work. You have to fall in love with your work, with the things or with the results you are producing that's going to make your confidence go up and your confidence is contagious okay people are naturally attracted 
to confident people. So love what you do and you will see everybody will follow. Okay. The second thing you should do is to be yourself, but don't make them mis the same mistake I did trying to copy the work of other photographers. What you should do instead is to learn from other photographers how they do things, okay? how do they work, and then integrate those concepts into your work, but adding your own flavor. So look for inspiration in different areas. For example, I am a boudoir photographer but I don't look at my competition. I don't look at other photographers for inspiration. I look at photographers that are in a different area. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, this is Gregory Crutzen is one of the photographers I, I love. His work is magnificent. There's, what, I, what I like about his work is the attention to detail. There's a lot of work behind each one of his images. Uh, everything in his images is deliberate. And I also love the use of light to create a specific mood. It's just wonderful how, how, can, how can he uh, trigger these emotions in, in you, you know, this sadness. It's fascinating. <clears throat> the other photographer that I love is Richard Tushman, and what I like about him is the painting quality of his images, uh, the use of color, and how he creates these magical worlds for his characters. Um, by the way, both of these photographers actually, they create their own sets. Okay, so um, in the case of uh, Gregory Crutzon, he actually works with a gigantic budget to create the sets where he photographs uh, people. Uh, in the case of Richard Tushman, he actually built uh, dioramas and then uh, Photoshop people into them later. Yeah, maybe that's the reason why their images look so flawless. I don't know. But anyway, I not only find inspiration in other photographers, I also find inspiration in, in other places like cinematography is something that I, I love. Okay, because I think it's very close to photography, uh, is, is photography in movement. <clears throat> so I love, I love cinematography, I love movies, and more specifically, for example, the work of Akira Kurosawa, which I think is a master in composition and the use of composition to create beautiful storytelling. So if you haven't had the chance to watch one of his movies, please, please do. Uh, his work is just fascinating. Okay, but now, if you want to really blow your own mind, watch Parasite. It's really a masterpiece. Everything in this movie has been done with very precise intention. From, the build, from building all the sets where this movie was filmed, they built all the sets from scratch. Um, to the, the camera movement, to the beautiful photography, and most importantly, the amazing use of composition to create captivating storytelling. Okay, there's a specific reason why you see some characters appearing on one side of the screen only. And so there's a lot of thought behind uh, the way the movie was filmed. The dialogue, the music, everything. Okay, so uh, watch the movie um, and then after that read a review on the composition of this movie, on the cinematography of, of this movie and then watch the movie again because I'm sure you're gonna miss something. And you know, do that maybe a couple of times because there's really a lot going on that we may not notice the first time we see the movie. Okay, so it's a fantastic movie. Watch it and let me know. Let me know in the comments what you think about this movie because I, for some people hate it, some people love it. I'm, you know, on the side of people that love the movie. I, I really love it. It's really, really well done. But anyway, okay, the third thing you need to do is to explore. Okay, you have to explore and practice and try new things, learn the rules and then break them. Okay, uh, you don't need, if you're shooting boudoir, you don't need to be confined to the bedroom, for example. Shoot in the kitchen, shoot in the bathroom, like in this photo. Uh, it's a beautiful, it's one of my favorite places to, to shoot. Um, add flavor to your images, don't be conventional, do unconventional things like adding fog, for example, in this image. Um, use color, don't be afraid of using a lot of color. Or, you know, try also black and white. 
in some cases, I think black and white helps drive your attention to different things that you probably won't see if you're using color. So try black and white as well and try different poses. Try different poses, go outside, be in contact with nature or hide behind a glass door. So whatever you want to do, just make sure it's consistent with who you are and what you want to communicate. So let me now quote one of the greatest photographers of all times, Ansel Adams, who said something that I think summarizes very well what I'm trying to say here. He said, there are always two people in every picture, the photographer and the viewer. So guys, uh, no matter what your style is, no matter what you photograph, at the end of the day, for me, the most important thing is to create deeper connections with people, to create this special bond between you and your audience, okay? Because that is going to make you be successful, that's going to make you relevant, and that's going to make your work memorable, okay? So please let me know in the comments below uh, where you find your inspiration, what your favorite artists are. And thank you very much for watching this video. Stay safe and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.